And good morning and welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church. I've got a few announcements for you this morning. Hopefully you have grabbed a bulletin by the door or you have a bulletin online. Uh, if you'll open that bulletin up, we have some OCC packing parties coming up on Wednesday nights. If you were here last Wednesday, you were a part of that. We want to say thank you. Uh, that was a huge success. How many bags of boxes did you pack? Like, um, 380. It was a lot of boxes. That was uh, efficient. So be here this upcoming Wednesday to pack some more boxes, and then the following Wednesday is the same thing. Uh, fall Festival on the 31st. There's a lot going on with Fall Festival. We're having a chili cook-off, so make sure to bring your best pot of chili. Also bring a donation. Those donations, all the donations we collect for uh, the bowls of chili are going to go toward OCC shipping costs. So there will be that. And then there will also be a bonfire that night and trunk or treat for the little kids. Um, not on your bulletin because this is new. Our business meeting for the month of November is going to be moved up one week. So it will be the first Sunday night of November, not the second. And then our leadership meeting and our finance meeting will also be that same day. Hey, if you are not involved in a Sunday school class, I would like to take this opportunity to encourage you to get involved with a Sunday school class. We have several Sunday school classes now. Um, we have a class that meets in here. Brandon's class meets in the back building. We have a woman's class that meets back here. That woman's class is starting a new book, new curriculum next Sunday. So see my wife, Chelsea, if, if you're a woman and wanting to be in that. And then we have another class that's uh, kind of working through the Bible. It's a three-year plan, three-year program. If you're interested in that, that class meets in here at 930. Uh, very briefly, I need building and grounds to meet with uh, Brother Steve. How about right up here in the front corner, immediately following service for about five minutes. Just need five minutes of your time, and that's going to be about um, the Fall Fest event and some of the things going on there that we need some help with. Other than that, if you're a guest here, I'd like to say welcome, and then if you would like to give to the church through your tithes and offerings, you can do through push pay, or you can do through the plate uh, by the front door. Other than that, I think that's about all I've got. I'm going to pray for us. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Hopefully you've had a blessed week. I'm going to pray and turn it over to the band. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this morning. back in your house, to be with believers, to be with other people who are like-minded. So God, we've shown up this morning to praise. plan to do this morning. So God, I pray that you would hear our voices, hear our songs. We try to make a joyful noise unto you. I pray that you would find delight in them this morning. Father God, we come here because we need you. We need you to infiltrate every area of our lives. teaching of your word this morning that lives would be changed, lives would be strengthened, that you would draw us closer and closer to you, that you would conform us more into the image of Christ. Father God, I pray that if anyone in here does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I begin that the whole, I pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to move and work right now, start to show them their desperate need for an eternal relationship with Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you for what you did. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And at this time, I, we invite your Holy Spirit into this room. Fill this room, fill this place with your spirit as we give you this time. We love you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
sometimes we forget the degree to which we belong to God. I think the ancient Hebrews understood it. That's why they call him Yahweh, which literally means breath giver. Because they understood that if it was not his will for you to take another breath, you would not. Yeah. His breath.
Love your wife like you love your own body. It's a pretty bold command. Confession. I wonder what goes through your mind when I say that. <laughs> Confession, one of the hardest things for me to do, a couple of years ago, early on, before praying publicly became my, kind of my profession, was to pray with my wife. It was difficult, to be honest. It was difficult to take her by the hand and pray out loud in front of her. It's not so much difficult anymore. But it was very difficult at a certain point in time. So I want to challenge the men in here. I want to challenge the women in here. If you're married today, I want to challenge you to pray for your spouse. Pray for your husband. Pray for your wife. But if you're a man in here, I want to push that challenge a little bit further. I want to challenge you to take her by the hand. Because I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. And I don't want to just do it today. I want to do it every day. I want to try to make a commitment to pray with you and pray for you every day. If you're a woman in the room, if you're married and your husband is here, and you want him to do that, in a moment when we go to go into a time of coming to the altar, there's an altar in the back. I, I want you to look at your husband and say, I want. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me, to pray for me. Because I'm, if I were a veterinarian, I would say that she probably wants you to do that, but she's probably just as nervous to tell you to do that as you are to pray for her. That would be my guess. So some ways that you can pray for your spouse, some ways that you can pray for your wife. First, pray for their salvation if maybe you're concerned about that. Second, pray for their relationship with God to grow. Pray for your wife's relationship with God to grow and blossom into something beautiful. Pray for God's strength in her or his life. Pray that God will reveal the truth of scripture to them. Pray that God would begin to conform them or continue conforming them into the man or woman that he has called them to be. Pray for their strength to stand when difficult times come in a marriage, because they are coming. Begin praying for that now. One day when I tell you Somebody in here is maybe uncomfortable with that. Maybe somebody in here struggles with that. And maybe you think you'll get upset with me for calling you out to do this. But I want to challenge you right now, just where you're sitting. Kneel down, sit in the chairs behind you. Go to the altar that come to the altar in the front. Grab your wife by the hand. So I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Wives, that's your opportunity to look at grab me at night before we go to bed and let's go pray together. Pray for your marriages. I'm going to 
going to give you just a moment before I begin to pray. Take this opportunity. Right where you are, at the altar in the back. If you need to go get your spouse, go get your spouse. Pray for God's blessings on our marriages. Pray for God's protection on our marriages. Join me as we pray for our marriages. Every couple in here, every family 
anchor. God, I pray for the men. I pray that I lift the men up to you. I pray that they would become men of prayer, men that will stand and grab their wife by the hand and pray with their wife. God, as I confess, it was hard for me to pray in front of my wife. It was hard for me at a point to pray for my wife, with my wife, in front of my wife. God, if that's any man in here today, I pray that you would give him the assertiveness, the boldness, the strength, and the courage to take his wife by the hand. Pray for his wife. To pray for his marriage. God, I pray for the women in here. I pray that the women would, in a soft, loving, kind manner, say to their husband, I want you to pray with me. I desire you to pray, to pray for me. So they can give their husband the assurance to know that that's what they want to. Bring them together in unity and bring them together in prayer. That way our marriages could represent the godly marriage that you've designed it to be. God, I don't know why you put this on my heart. I have no idea. I have no idea the situation of every couple in this room, but Father, you do. And we lift them up to you now. I'm thankful for our church, brothers and sisters that we can come to and surround ourselves with to encourage our marriages, to strengthen us. I pray that you would use this day, use this time right now to do that. To set these men and women on the right course of prayer for their lives, for their marriage. Heal what is broken. Strengthen the weak. Uphold the faithful. Uphold the strong. We love you, Father God. We thank you.
is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Father, we are so thankful for this day. God, we're thankful for the very breath that you put in our lives. And we ask that you give us strength as we give that breath back to you in praise of your name. God, we thank you for the blessings in our life. God, we thank you for a church family to worship you. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you specifically this morning for our spouses. God, we know that you have placed them in our life and you have done so for a reason. God, you have put the things and the people around us that we need in order for us to become the person that you're trying to make us into. And God, we thank you for that. We trust your judgment in that. God, we pray that you would help us to see the path that you've laid out. God, we pray now as we go into the teaching time. We know that you've guided Brother Ray in his studies. We pray now that you guide him as he delivers your message. God, we pray that you would be with each person in here. That we would be receptive to your word as it goes out. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name. Andrew, by the way, this morning, go ahead and turn to the book of James as we continue our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study through the book of James. We are going to be in James chapter 3 this morning, beginning in verse 13. We'll give you a moment to find your place there. I'm going to talk to you for just a second. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions this morning. If I were to ask you, <coughs> who in here thinks that they are knowledgeable? How many of you would raise your hand? How many of you want to be knowledgeable? About half, uh, there's more now, about half of us want to be knowledgeable. What if I were to change the question slightly and I say, how many of you in here this morning think that you are wise? Would you raise your hand? Ace in the back of the room. <laughs> how many of you, you how many people in here want to be wise this morning? How many of you want to be wise? There's a lot of hands in here that are wise. So I ask you these two questions, or really four, but two different subjects, knowledge and wisdom. And the reason I ask you both of these this morning is because knowledge and wisdom, even though they sound the same, they are very much different. They are not the same thing. So I want to give you a definition of what knowledge is. Knowledge is having or obtaining information. Having or obtaining information. We all have smartphones. You can grab your smartphone from your pocket, type in any question in Google, and obtain all the knowledge that you want on any given subject. And you can have that knowledge. But what about wisdom? What is wisdom? I want to give you the, the definition that I found when I Googled the definition of wisdom. And it says this. It says, the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. That's a mouthful. Let me say it again. Wisdom is the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. In other words, wisdom is simply applying the knowledge that you have. Wisdom is applying the knowledge that you have. Now I want to give you a biblical definition of wisdom. A biblical definition of wisdom. It is beginning to see things as God sees them and then living by those things seen. Seeing things as God sees them and then doing those things or living by those things in which you have seen. So this morning, if you haven't already guessed, we are going to be talking about knowledge and wisdom. Did you know the Bible actually has a lot to say about wise people and about having wisdom? The Bible is full of stuff to talk about wisdom. There's actually over 300 different Bible verses 
that deal directly with the subject matter of being wise or wisdom. So in today's passage, you will find that's exactly what we are talking about. We are talking about being wise, having wisdom. So if you've found your place and you are physically able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word this morning, beginning in verse 13, going down through verse 18. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I want to bring you a message this morning that I've titled, Walking in Wisdom. Walking in Wisdom. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you again now. Father, I pray that you'd hide me behind your cross, that you would give me only your words, that this would not be of me, but this would be all of you. Father God, speak through me, simply use me as an instrument this morning, that the people, your people, your church this morning would hear from you, hear directly from you, and learn what they have, or learn what you have in store for them, and then be able to apply it to their lives. Father God, we lift this up to you now, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. So again, going back to the beginning of this section here, verse 13, James begins with this question. He has a question for us. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Who is wise and understanding among you? I simply ask that question as we open up. Does anyone in here think that they are wise? And that's the same thing that James is saying. He's speaking to his crowd, his audience here, the people that he's writing this letter to. He says, who thinks that they are wise? Who thinks that they are wise? And it's almost as if he's saying that there's not very many wise people among you. Because wisdom is something that's highly sought after. It's something that's valuable, but it's something that is rare. It's rare to find really wise people. So who thinks that they are wise? Now look at the second part of this verse, part B. He says, let him show by good conduct... That his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. He says, so if you're claiming to be wise, show me that you're wise by, look at this, by your good conduct and by your works. Your good conduct and your works will show your true wisdom. James is saying, if you're claiming to be wise, your conduct, your conduct excuse me, and your works will be manifested from that wisdom. There were obviously people in James' day, just like there are in our day today, that, are, that claim to be smart. They claim to be very wise. But their actions do not show their wisdom. Their actions do not show that they're wise. You ever met somebody that claims to be smart or thinks that they're smart, thinks that they have wisdom, yet they, they do some of the dumbest things? You ever met anybody like that? They do really dumb things, and then so you're thinking to yourself, there's no way that you're as smart or that you have the wisdom that you think you have because your actions show that they're dumb decisions. This is what James is saying. He's saying, let you show me by your good conduct and your works where your true wisdom is coming from. If you claim to be wise, show me by your conduct, the way you act, right? Show me by your works, the things that you do. And can we, can we go a step further and say, show me by the way you speak, by the, the, the things you say? And all of these will be a good indication of the type of wisdom that you possess. But James isn't done there, right? James isn't done there. He says, let it be done within the meekness of wisdom. In the meekness of wisdom. Well, what does meekness mean? What does meekness mean? Again, 
you want to have that knowledge, you Google the word meekness. And one definition that you might find about meekness, uh, and I say submissiveness. Meekness means submissiveness. But Bible commentators have written a biblical definition of meekness. And they say that meekness in the Bible really refers to power under control. Meekness is power under control. Have you ever heard that before? It carries the notation of a horse that's been trained, this horse that has all of this strength, that has all of this power, but the horse has been trained, so all that strength and that power is under control. So you say you're wise. What do your works, what does your conduct say about you? And then are you doing those things out of meekness? That's the subject matter of today's text. And then, like James has done throughout the rest of his letter and in everything that we've looked at before, he's going to give us these examples, and he's going to really lay this out for us. That way we can evaluate our lives against what he's fixing to say. In the following verses, he's fixing to give us two different types of wisdom for us to evaluate our lives against. Two different types of wisdom. So the intent here is, you think you're wise, you say you're wise, listen to what I have to say, which category do you fall into? Let's look at the first category. The first type of wisdom, verse 14 through 16. He says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. That's the first type of wisdom. It, it's human wisdom. That's what I'm going to call it. it. It's human wisdom. This is the first type. Okay, now as we break human wisdom down, the first thing that I want to discuss is the source of human wisdom. Again, verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not ascend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So immediately in verse 15, we can draw from the source of this wisdom that it is, one, it is not from above. It's right there in the text. This wisdom does not descend from above. Then immediately following that, we see that this wisdom is, is first, that it is earthly. It is earthly. Second, that it is sensual or meaning fleshly. And then thirdly, it is demonic. I believe that we can say all of these things accurately, and we're going to start with the first. We're going to say the first one, earthly. Your wisdom comes from earthly ideas. Let's, let's take colleges, for example. Colleges everywhere are teaching uh, young adults that there is no God. They teach them things that are contradictory to the Bible. And it's because of their worldviews. They do not have a biblical worldview. So the worldview is the way that you view the world. You will either have a Christian worldview that you view the world through a biblical Christian lens, or you will have an earthly, worldly worldview that you don't believe in God, that you believe in, we came from monkeys and all that kind of stuff. And depending on what your worldview is will depend on the type of knowledge that you possess. And this type of knowledge is earthly. If you're, if you're taking what the college professor says, that there is no God, that we descended from monkeys, that is an earthly or worldly source of wisdom. The next source, it says, is sensual, or you could use the word flesh. This, this type of wisdom is from the flesh. It feels right to me, so therefore it must be right. My flesh says that this, right, this is right, so that's what I'm going to do because my flesh says so. You've heard the saying that there is uh, no truth is absolute. Have you heard that? No truth is absolute. That's the absolute dumbest thing I've ever heard about. No truth is absolute, meaning that truth is relative. So what's true for you isn't true for me, and what's true for me may not be true for you. That's crazy. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. So this is this, this flesh. This is what's right to me. I'm going to do the decisions that I make is just driven out of my own selfish, fleshly desires. The third thing that he says, the next source that this type of wisdom comes from is a demonic source. Satan and his demons have a powerful influence, obviously, over this world and the people that are in it. That's why people think that it is justifiable to kill people, to murder people, to bomb buildings and blow up planes. That's demonic. That's satanic type of wisdom. 
suicide bombers believe that it is okay for them to blow people up because those people disagree with their worldview. That's satanic. That is demonic. People believe that it is okay to kill unborn innocent babies. That's demonic. That's where this wisdom is coming from. He says it can come from the world, it can come from your flesh, or it can come from a demonic source. That's the source of this type of wisdom. But I want to draw you back to verse 14 for, for just a moment. Look at verse 14 with me. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. Notice what James is saying here. He says, if, if these things exist in your hearts, this bitterness, this self-seeking is in your, in your hearts. We've talked a lot about the condition of the heart during this series in James. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how we are tempted to sin when we are drawn away by our heart's own lust. We are tempted away because our, our hearts love for that sin. We talked about how the tongue is just an outflow, it's an overflow of what's really in the heart. Right? Now James is saying if you have bitterness and self-envy in your hearts, don't say that you have true wisdom because these are not the characteristics or the traits of true wisdom. Now I want to look at the traits of human wisdom. The traits of human wisdom. We looked at the source, now let's look at the, the traits. Verse 14. There are eight traits that I would like to point out to you in verses 14 and 15. But if you have bitter, there's the first one. Bitterness, anger, resentful. If your wisdom, if the let's go with this one. If you if the decisions that you make are based out of bitterness or anger, that's human wisdom. That is not the wisdom of God. Look at the next word, envy. Envious. Are you jealous over what other people have? If, if you're making decisions based out of jealousy, that is human wisdom. Keep going. And self-seeking. Are you self-seeking? Are you constantly putting yourself above everybody else? Are the decisions that you're making based out of self-seeking? Look, keep going. Self-seeking in your hearts and do not boast. Are you boastful? Are you bragging? Are you always the center of attention? Look at what I've done. Two more words. And lie. Lying. Do you, do you lie to get ahead at work in your workplace? Are you dishonest? If the decisions that you're making are based out of lies, that's, that's human wisdom. Keep going. This wisdom does not descend from above, but as we've already looked at these, earthly, sensual, and demonic. Let's take earthly real, just briefly. Do the things of this world persuade you to make the decisions that you make? Do the decisions you make, are they based out of earthly ideas? Are the things of the world persuading you to act and make certain decisions? What about sensual? Is your flesh doing that? Is it I'm going to make this decision because this is what feels good to me no matter what everybody else thinks or what everybody else feels, no matter how it impacts other people's lives. Is that where the decisions are coming from? I'm going to lie about this to get ahead. I'm going to divorce my wife because I'm tired of dealing with it. I'm going to put myself first. What about money? I'm going to make these decisions. I'm going to rip these people off so I can put an extra coin in my pocket. That is sensual. What about demonic? Do the decisions you make contradict the Word of God? If the Bible's telling you to act a certain way or do a certain thing or live a certain way, are the decisions you're making contradictory to what the Bible is saying? James is saying these are the characteristics or these are the traits of someone who does not possess godly wisdom. Their wisdom is coming from the world. It's coming from their flesh. It's demonic. The next thing I want to show you regarding human wisdom is the result of human wisdom. The result of human wisdom. Look at verse 16 with me. He says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. James kind of goes back and reiterates verse 14, where envy and self-seeking, we just looked at that, where those things exist in the heart, confusion and evil are there 
also. Let me just say, if, if you want to abort a baby for selfish, self-seeking reasons, evil is there. Evil is there. If you want to divorce your spouse because, I don't know, life would be better off without her or without him, whatever the case may be, evil is there. If you're lying at work to try to promote yourself above someone else, evil is there. James says, wherever envy, wherever this self-seekingness is, confusion and evil, all sorts, every type of evil are there. This is the first type of wisdom that James calls our attention to. And I believe after looking at human wisdom and these traits of human wisdom, I would beg to differ that everybody in here is probably going to agree that that's not the type of wisdom that I want to possess. Mm-hmm. Correct? We all would say, no, no, I don't want that type of wisdom. And if somebody was acting with these traits or these characteristics, we would certainly say, those people are not smart. They are not wise. They're not acting wisely. They're doing dumb things. And we would say, no, don't, don't do that. That's dumb. Right? Look with me at verse 17 and 18, and let's look at the second type of wisdom that James calls our attention to. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now just like with human wisdom, we're going to break godly wisdom down the same way. The second type of wisdom that James calls our attention to is godly wisdom. Now let's look at the source of godly wisdom, verse 17. But that wisdom is from above. Godly wisdom is a gift from above. It's a gift from God. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, knowledge can be learned off of a simple Google search. Wisdom is given. Wisdom is a gift from God. Remember back in James chapter 1, verse 5? James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Do you remember that? James says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God, and if it's godly wisdom that you're seeking, God will give you that type of wisdom. That's exactly what Solomon did in the Old Testament. Solomon did just that God asked Solomon, what would you have me to do for you? What would you have me to give to you? Solomon said, I want wisdom and understanding. That way I can do God's will and God's purpose. I can see God's plan. That's what he wanted. Second Chronicles chapter 1, verse 11 and 12 record this for us. It says, Then God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches, or wealth, or honor. He's not asking for selfish, self-seeking things, remember? You haven't asked for these, or the life of your inner enemies, nor have you asked for a long life, but have asked for wisdom. And you ask for knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Verse 12, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the king's have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the life. Then 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 30 says, Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled or exceeded the wisdom of all the men of the east and all of the wisdom of Egypt. See, Solomon wanted godly wisdom. So he asked God for godly wisdom, and God granted him that prayer request. Wisdom is a gift from God. It is a gift from above. So this is the source of godly wisdom. Let's look at the traits of godly wisdom, just like we did with human wisdom. We looked at eight traits of human wisdom. Now we're going to look at eight traits of godly wisdom. And this is right here in the text. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. There it is, number one, pure. It's, that is, it's free of contamination. It's holy. And get this, it's starting to see things the way that God sees them and then doing them. That's pure. Next, peaceable. There's the second one. Are the decisions that you're making in your life bringing about peace? We're going to just ask the same questions that we ask with human wisdom, right? Next, gentle. Are the decisions that you're making 
gentle? Are you gentle towards <coughs> others? What about willing to yield next? Do you put others before yourself? That's a big one. Remember we talked about that a minute ago with human wisdom. Are you putting yourself first or are you putting other people first? Are you willing to yield to others? Do you put others before yourself or is it all about you? Next, full of mercy. Do you show mercy to those around you? Are you full of good fruits? Do the decisions that you make produce good, godly fruits? Next, without partiality. We talked about partiality a couple of weeks ago. Do you show partiality to others? That is favoritism. It's saying it's without favoritism. It's without partiality. And lastly, number eight, without hypocrisy. Do you say one thing and then do another? That's hypocrisy. So here's the trait. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield, full of mercy, full of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. There they are. But it's, it's amazing to me how James, how much James, reflects on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew chapter 5. Just look at verse 17 for these traits for, for just a second. Peaceable. Are you a peacemaker? Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers. It says mercy. Are you merciful? Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful. It says that it's pure. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Are you pure in heart? Matthew chapter 5, again, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. Go back to verse 13, that you're supposed to act this way. These, these good works and good fruits and good conduct are done in the meekness. Are you meek? Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek. James is echoing the Sermon on the Mount over and over and over again, saying that true wisdom is a gift from God. You want to live a blessed life? You have true wisdom of God. Read Matthew chapter 5. Read the Sermon on the Mount. On the Mount. Read the blessed are. Blessed are the peacemakers, the merciful. These are the traits of godly wisdom. Again, just like human wisdom, let's look at the results of godly wisdom next. The results of godly wisdom. Wisdom. Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The people who possess godly wisdom are the people who sow the things of God. They sow peace. They sow good fruits. They sow righteousness. That's the, that's the outflow. That's the result. That's the product of godly wisdom. You see, the evidence of godly wisdom that they, that they claim to possess is found in their conduct. Remember verse 13? It's found in their works. And it will be evident because they possess the true wisdom of God. Now, if I were to ask you who wants to receive the true wisdom of God, I bet every person in here would raise their hands. Every person in here wants to possess this type of of the true wisdom. There's not a person in here that would say, no, I don't, I don't want that. Right? But how does godly wisdom really help our lives in contrast to having humanly wisdom? I'm going to give you two ways. God gives us godly wisdom to help us make the right decisions. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Wisdom to, listen to this though, wisdom to pursue God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. That's godly wisdom, to pursue God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. You cannot begin to pursue God's plan and purpose for your life if you do not possess any godly wisdom. And number two, like number one, is godly wisdom will help you or keep you from making wrong decisions. If it will help you make the right decisions, then obviously it will keep you or help you from making the wrong decisions. Godly wisdom will show you the dangers in making those humanly or human type of decisions that human wisdom is telling you to do, God's wisdom will show you that that's not the right path. That's, that's destruction. That path leads to destruction. And godly wisdom will keep you from those destructive paths. Now maybe you're asking this morning, well, how do I begin to possess this 
godly wisdom. Maybe you said, well, maybe I do possess a little, maybe I don't possess a little, maybe maybe some of the decisions I make are made out of selfish, fleshly desires. Maybe those are the decisions that I make. How do I begin to possess godly wisdom? Go back to verse 14. It starts with the heart. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? First, you have to have the Holy Spirit living inside you who will give you a new heart. A heart that begins to see things differently. He'll give you that new biblical Christian worldview. You begin to see and understand things differently. The way Scripture says that you should understand them instead of the way the world tells you to understand them. The Bible says that if you confess your your mouth and believe in your heart that you will be saved, or believe in Jesus, you will be saved. You have to put your hope and trust in Jesus Christ first and foremost. Listen to this verse. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord coming to a true knowledge, again, that having that true knowledge of who God is and reverencing him as the one and only Lord God is the beginning to making wise decisions. If you, if you don't acknowledge, if you don't have the knowledge, you don't possess the knowledge of who God really is, you can't make good, godly, wise decisions. Proverbs 9, 10 says that you have to understand and have the knowledge of who he is before you can be wise. That's the beginning to having wisdom. Second, first, you have to know Jesus Christ. Second, you need to read his word. Study his word. Solomon was obviously the wisest man who ever lived. He wrote Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon. Proverbs has 31 chapters. You've heard, read a chapter a day. Read one chapter of Proverbs a day. It is full of the wisdom of God. Read the Word of God. Pray and study Scripture. Memorize it. Saturate your mind with Scripture. And then thirdly, you pray for wisdom. You pray for wisdom. You pray for wisdom, understanding, and discernment. Solomon prayed for wisdom, and God granted him that prayer request. James chapter 1, verse 5 tells us, If you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he will give it to you. So my question to you this morning is, what kind of wisdom do you possess? Do you have human wisdom that is earthly and fleshly, and the decisions that you're making are made based out of your own selfish, fleshly desires? You do the things that you want to do because you're king and you're lord over your own life? Do you make your decisions based on your wants? What your flesh, what your lust tells you is the right decision? Or do you have godly wisdom? Do you have godly wisdom? Is is the wisdom of God infiltrating your life and helping you to make good, sound, biblical decisions over your life? There's a difference between godly wisdom and human wisdom. Do you know what God's word says, number one, and then do you make your decisions based on the word of God? Do you know what his word says, and then do you make your decisions based on what his word says? Because those are the right decisions to make, and that is the beginning to walking in true wisdom. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, maybe I make some good decisions, maybe I make some bad decisions, and we're all right there together. I want to possess more and more godly wisdom. I believe godly wisdom is something that grows over time. God gives you more and more godly wisdom. Do you have any godly wisdom? Do you have a little? Do you have a lot? Do you need more? I need more. Let me pray for you this morning. Come talk to me. Maybe you've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, like we just talked about. The beginning to this knowledge is the fear and reverence of the Lord, making good, wise decisions over your life. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you are ready to take that first step. Maybe you are ready to join the church. Whatever it is, I'll be down front. Please come and talk to me. Don't leave here today with any unsettled business. Maybe this message has spoken to you, how the Holy Spirit is moving or working. Don't leave here today without being obedient. Respond obediently to how the Holy Spirit is calling you to respond. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you now. We are thankful for this day to be back in your house. And as we looked at 
James chapter 3 in godly wisdom versus our own wisdom, human wisdom, this earthly, sensual wisdom. God, I know that I can speak for myself and probably everybody in here that some of the decisions that we make are earthly. They're fleshly. They're prideful decisions, God. That we are tempted by our heart's own lust and our heart's own desires, and then we make those decisions based on putting ourselves first, self-seeking. Maybe we lie to get ahead. We're dishonest to get what we want. Maybe it's all about me, so I'm willing to hurt whoever it is in my path in order to get what it is that I want. Father God, I pray for more and more godly wisdom. I pray that you would give me godly wisdom to follow you and your word faithfully each and every day of my life. Illuminate scripture and show me how to live a godly life. As I read and study your word, I pray that you would impart biblical knowledge to me and then give me the eyes to see it, how you see it, and then give me the strength and obedience to follow that word, to follow those commands, to follow your word. Lord God, I pray for godly wisdom this morning. Help me, lead me, show me how to make every decision, how to make the decisions each and every day of my life that are honoring to you, that lift up and that glorify you, that show people around me Jesus Christ is king of my life, that it's not about me, that it's about you. Father God, I lift up anybody in here right now that may be struggling. Maybe they're struggling with their salvation. Maybe you're calling them, leading them into eternal life. Maybe you're leading them into uh, a life that follows you. Maybe uh, you're leading them to um, profess publicly with baptism, their, their, their faith that they put in you. Maybe you're calling them to join this church. God, I pray that you would give them the strength and the courage to stand up and be obedient to whatever the Holy Spirit is saying this morning. Father God, I'm so thankful again today for today to be in your house and to open up your word. Believers, I just pray that you would move and work in only a way that you can right now. We love you. We 